Hi everyone, it's Celeste. Welcome to my channel. Well, today I'm excited to share some wonderful books with you. It's November and that can only mean one thing. It's nonfiction November. And this is a tag which is the brainchild of Olive from a book Olive. I will share her channel link down below. Uh, but every year in November, it's a great time to explore some new authors and new subjects in nonfiction or to revisit visit some old favorite nonfiction works. So the books I'm going to be sharing with you today generally fall into two categories. The first category will be some gentle nature reads and um, these are sort of not hugely intimidating but lovely nature books. Um, they're all nonfiction except for one. And then secondly, I'm going to share some other nonfiction books which I have already read in past years but which I personally loved and would recommend for you to check out. Now I'd like to start out with um, some gentle nature reads which are about the subject of birds. I love birds. I'm an avid bird watcher. I feed all the little birdies in the backyard here behind the dairy farm. I also love to visit a rescue bird of prey facility nearby called Wild Wings and that is where they rescue raptors and other birds um, which have been in accidents or who have been injured in some way and they rehab them and they teach the public about birds and bird conservation. Um, and I love it there so much. My friends know me very well. They know I love wild wings. And so this past year, I was actually gifted three bricks in the donor walk, which is a brick pathway leading up to wild wings rescue facility for raptors and um, it was just the loveliest gift and there's an inscription on the bricks to me and to my son it was really super meaningful to me uh, couldn't have gotten a nicer gift and um, what else I was so appreciative it was so meaningful and I also um, recently uh, had some fun writing a poem about a bird for a local contest sponsored by Writers and Books and the Seneca Park Zoo. And um, it was called uh, Poetry Takes Wing. And the guidelines were that you had to write a poem involving a bird or birds, and it had to be sort of grounded in an ethos of conservation and environmentalism. The contest was actually judged by an author that I really respect, and that is uh, J. Drew Lanham. J. Drew Lanham is an ornithologist, and he is the author of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. This is a absolutely beautiful nonfiction book. I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, so I actually was one of the co-winners in the adult category, which was really exciting for me. I and another gentleman had uh, entered poems in the published adult category and we were the co-winners we tied and so it was really fun to be able to go downtown um, last week and to be able to read my poem at the rochester reads book festival um, so that was really a lot of fun and i just think it was wonderful that it was sponsored by the seneca park zoo and i thank all the people that were involved in that contest and my poem was about a baltimore oriole so onward um, sometimes when people are choosing books for nonfiction November or thinking about participating in nonfiction November, they're thinking of some pretty heavy reads. Um, there are some people who read lots and lots of nonfiction all throughout the year. I do as well. I read a lot of history and social history, as you know. But um, sometimes it's easy to feel intimidated by a heavier book or a really involved book. But why not start out with something that's just sort of light and interesting and that you will learn a lot from? If you're interested in birds and you're looking for an nature read, I recommend this book and it is 
bird songs, 250 North American birds in song. And this is kind of an interactive uh, field guide and it's just lovely. It is um, featuring audio from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Cornell University is not too far away from here. It's just a little bit south. And so um, this is by Les Boletsky. And what's really fun about this book is that you open it up and there's a beautiful uh, rendering of the birds in question and these are all North American birds so for example the common loon and you can read all about the common loon and then you'll notice a little number here and what you do is you go over to this side and you can play the song of the common loon bear with me okay here we go And then it's going to repeat. It's just haunting. I remember um, loons down at the lake house that we used to own um, on Cuca Lake. And um, it's just such a lovely haunting sound. There's everything in here from cardinals to bald eagles to screech owls to um, you know chimney swifts and hummingbirds and warblers and Canada geese and trumpeter swans and all of that and uh, so if you have a bird lover in your life or someone who's interested in becoming a bird lover I would highly recommend this book. Uh, this book is very well worn and this part is actually sort of falling off. I have to re-glue it and get new batteries for this. It's very meaningful for me because at the time that I purchased this, it was actually a gift from my parents. And at the time, uh, my son was just being diagnosed with his autism diagnosis. Simultaneously, my father uh, was suffering from non-Alzheimer's dementia and uh, my mother had had a massive stroke and both of them were living in an assisted living facility and I was their power of attorney and would do a lot of errands for them and shopping and banking and uh, grocery shopping and all kinds of things. My mother had lost her ability to uh, walk for very long distances so she was pretty much confined to a wheelchair and um, my father was trying to communicate with her and so uh, she, had, she wasn't able to speak very well either. She went through a lot of rehabilitation. She did regain the ability to um, say a few words and to sing, believe it or not. She was always an avid bird lover and that's definitely where I get my love of bird watching from. But anyways, um, I would go over there with this book and uh, we would all sit outside on the patio of the assisted living facility and my father would hold the book in his lap and my mom would be next to him and they would go through and just play the different bird sounds and sometimes my mother would repeat the name of the bird um, and sometimes my son would as well so it's just a very special memory for me and um, it's this kind of a book that can really bring family members together with um, uh, a common love of something as lovely as birds in your backyard. So yeah, bird songs, North American birds in song, um, highly recommend it. Well, if you're ready to try a book that goes into a little bit more depth and you enjoy memoir writing, as well as wanting to learn more about birds, I highly recommend the New York Times bestseller H is for Hawk by Helen McDonald. Now, uh, Helen McDonald was a falconer. Um, she talks about the grieving process that she went through after the death of her father. This book won the Samuel Johnson Prize and I think also the Costa Book of the Year Award. Um, her grieving process was aided by taking care of a young goshawk 
talk named Mabel, and um, it describes the year that Helen McDonald spent training Mabel. It's just a fantastic book. It's almost kind of hard to explain, um, but it it almost the story of her training the bird almost becomes just kind of a scaffolding, and the real story is about her sort of coming back to the world and coming back to life after her father's death, which hit her really, really hard. And Helen MacDonald herself has said that it's really hard to write about nature without writing about grief in some form. Now, um, part of this book also is a journey to learn more about the author T.H. White uh, at the time that he was writing his own book about goshawks, and that is The Goshawk by T.H. White. So it refers to this book quite a bit. Um, so you may want to grab a copy of this one if you're going to read this one, but it's, it's not absolutely critical, it's just fun. Um, and I have a personal connection to Helen McDonald because several years ago, I had seen an advertisement on Facebook that a friend had posted, and they were saying that uh, Breadloaf, which is at Middlebury College in Vermont, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, was going to begin offering um, a new workshop in environmental nonfiction writing. And so people were invited to submit nonfiction essays on a nature theme and um, they would be considered for this workshop. So I didn't think I had a chance in the world. I had only written and submitted poetry to contests prior to that and had not done any essay writing, any nonfiction writing whatsoever. Um, I did write a piece and submit it and um, to my huge unending surprise, it was accepted, and um, I was accepted into a workshop with Helen McDonald. Um, this was in, I think, 2019, so I got to pack up my little tiny car and drive myself to the mountains of Vermont and go to Middlebury College and stay at the inn there. The mountains are absolutely gorgeous. The company was wonderful. Um, they were really attentive to my needs as someone with celiac to eat gluten-free. It was all really uh, healthy, delicious food. Um, there were bonfires every night and it was just the most wonderful, wonderful experience. I can't praise the Breadloaf Conference highly enough. And, um, in terms of working with Helen McDonald, she was absolutely wonderful. She was delightful to speak to. She was really helpful and gave some really great uh, notes as far as my essay was concerned. Uh, we would all meet every morning uh, in a library and discuss our works and we went through a group of us sitting around a large table and in between we'd take little breaks and um, I remember you know just little moments here and there of um, uh, oh, making puns and jokes about, you know, with Star Trek references and science fiction. She's a fan of science fiction. She's also a fan of listening to Agatha Christie um, on uh, Audible or, you know, whatever service she uses, but she was listening to a lot of Agatha Christie. I think it was at the time that she wrote this. She had suggested some wonderful other nature essays in her syllabus, and she was just really down to earth and a lot of fun. So um, it was a great experience for me, and having read H's for Hawk, I just absolutely uh, was enthralled by Helen. Here's her autograph on the front page of my copy of the book. Um, I do have a, a funny story about um, when I was meeting Helen McDonald and working with her at Bread Loaf. There was one evening when I was sitting in the lobby area in a chair and there was a big fire in the fireplace and um, 
she came in and stood in front of me and was looking at titles of books on a bookshelf next to me. And um, instead of looking up and speaking back to her and responding, I, for some reason, uh, was just starstruck by her and I absolutely froze. And I couldn't even get myself to look up at her, which was crazy. It was absolutely ridiculous because during the day in the class, she was just very down to earth, very nice. But for some reason in that moment when it was just the two of us and I finally had my big moment to have, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Helen McDonald, you know, an author I revere, I absolutely froze and just kind of um, stumbled through my words and I don't even know what I said at this point. But uh, anyways, Helen, if you ever see this, I'm so sorry about that. Why did I do that? Duh. Um, anyway, H is for Hawk has passages of absolutely mesmerizing prose. It's poetry in prose form. It is a very rejuvenating and life-affirming story which takes you through this woman's grief process and back into society. Um, she has since said that this is a period of her life which is over now. Um, she's moved on and she's actually a very outgoing and um, I don't know, happy person. I don't know if happy is the right word, but it, but she's very outgoing, very um, fun to be with, tells jokes, uh, you know. So she says this period of her life she has put behind her, but wow, what a period of her life. Uh, if you've never read this and you can only read one nonfiction nature book, this one, it's wonderful. Another of my absolute favorite books about birds is The Peregrine by J.A. Baker. Oh my goodness, this book. This book is a harder read than um, H is for Hawk, uh, for sure, but it is well worth the journey and the effort. Uh, J.A. Baker was basically like an office worker who from 1954 to 1964 tracked peregrine falcons uh, that hunted over his county in Essex and um, he would just uh, go out with a notebook with his journals and just observe the peregrine falcons hunting and swooping and all of that. He wrote page after page after page of journal notes and this was a huge labor of love. Like I said, it extended about a decade. And then he compressed all of that into this book, which is actually quite slim. But wow, this language, if you think H is for Hawk is poetic, I don't even know how to explain this. It's um, incantatory. It is like a spell being cast. The prose in this is so rich, so beautiful, so full of mouthfeel. This book is unique. It is an experience in itself. If you have ever read a book like H is for Hawk, or if you've ever read Robert McFarlane's prose, um, they, I think they would agree with this too, to be fair. They learned from the master. J.A. Baker is incredible. I mean, this is just a guy that went out and took journal notes and then compressed them. Um, it was a decade collapsed into a season of hawk hunting and he stripped the narrative down to the bone. It is incredible. Um, also, if you feel like you can't sustain the beauty of reading the prose for too intense or long a period of time, you can listen to it, and it is narrated by no other than the amazing Sir David Attenborough, and he's another favorite of mine. And so the way that he recites J.A. Baker's seminal work is amazing also. And um, the word amazing doesn't really do justice to what I'm trying to explain, but um, it's just, Every sound that can fit in your mouth, every, every description of clouds and sunset 
and waves and fields and uh, you know wheat swaying and bird wings and feathers in sunlight and all of that it's like a prose poem it's gorgeous and um, he has definitely communicated to us uh, forever the essence of what it is like to be and to watch a peregrine <laughs> now recently i was lucky enough to go over to the wild wings facility and um, every weekend uh, the assistants there will bring out one or two of the birds of prey or the raptors which are in rehab and uh, we were lucky enough to go there recently when they were bringing out fission the peregrine falcon and we learned all about peregrine falcons and then as you'll see in this clip um, I had been asking um, the very kind assistant what can we do just in terms of our own backyard ecology to help birds and to help them survive and so she was giving some tips as you're about to see on how to do that that was fun. right So what can we do in terms of helping songbirds just as a resident in our own backyard? Right. Be looking to buy native plants as opposed to ornamental. Our, you know, beautiful bushes like things like burning bush, they have berries on them, but they're like candy. Um, things like choke cherries and uh, winter berries and um, native dogwoods all have nutritious berries. Okay. So they're helping out that way. Um, certainly leaving more shrubs in your yard, snags like wood piles, um, definitely leaving the leaves in fall because birds are going to be eating the insects that are underneath those oh, leaves. Oh, got you. Okay. And we keep cleaning everything up. Our, our lawns, unfortunately, are, you know, nutritious desert for more. Wow. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. And thank you, Fission. Beautiful. I'm going to just zoom in on fission sneezing here. Beautiful. Thank you. Yep. Now, if you'll recall, I had also mentioned that I had one gentle nature read, which was fiction. And it's one that I haven't actually read yet, but I'm super excited to read it this week. And that is A Kestrel for a Knave by Barry Hines. Um, this is considered a masterpiece. It was also made into a motion picture, which is called Kess, which is also really, really highly rated. And I'll just read you the back flap from this book. Um, it is about Billy Casper. Billy Casper is a troubled teenager growing up in a Yorkshire mining town. Treated as a failure at school and unhappy at home, Billy discovers a new passion in his life when he finds Kess, a kestrel hawk. Billy identifies with her silent strength and she inspires in him the trust and love that nothing else can. Ken Loach's well-known film adaptation, Kess, has achieved cult status, and the author, Barry Hines, um, is also really, really interesting. Um, Barry Hines uh, was born in a mining village, and he uh, played football. He worked as a mining surveyor. Uh, he worked in phys ed, and then um, he finally uh, taught for several years in London and Yorkshire before becoming a full-time writer. He not only wrote A Kestrel for a Knave, but he also um, 
wrote many scripts for television, including Threads, which won the BAFTA award. So, um, yeah, so, and this is a picture of um, the author on the back. So, yes, um, so this is about Billy Casper and how very much similar to um, H is for Hawk, how a bird um, sort of helps someone cope with grief, cope with difficulties and hardships in life. And um, it doesn't seem like a very long novel to read. It's by Penguin. This is one of their modern classics editions. And so I am really, really looking forward to reading A Kestrel for a Knave. And the uh, title comes from a, uh, I believe it's medieval. Let me look it up here. Selected from the Book of St. Albans in 1486, um, an eagle for an emperor, a gerfalcon for a king, a peregrine for a prince, a saker for a knight, a merlin for a lady, a goshawk for a yeoman, a sparrowhawk for a priest, a musket for a holy water clerk, a kestrel for a knave. And I think this refers to who would use which bird in falconing, maybe? You often see um, riding parties and hunting parties in tapestries with various birds of prey on their wrists. Um, I think on their wrists. Um, I just love learning about that whole culture with the blindfolds and the jessies and all of that sort of thing. Um, I'm making it sound like I know what I'm talking about, but um, in any event, I think this looks like just a lovely, lovely little novel, and I'm going to be reading it this week, so I'll let you know how it was. Next up, I would like to share a little bit of field trip footage. Um, recently, my son and I went over to a park which isn't too far away from our home here at the farm. And it's a lovely little park that has a beautiful little series of waterfalls. Um, it also has some interesting Native American history. Um, the um, Native Americans that were in our area, the Seneca, um, used these waterway paths as hunting routes and um, used them uh, as sort of maps um, to travel along when they were hunting. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And when we went, we brought the book Upstream by Mary Oliver with us. Enjoy. So that was a lot of fun. You know, if you're looking for a, another uh, nonfiction book, which I would consider sort of a gentle nature read, I don't think you can go too far wrong with Mary Oliver. And I think Upstream is a really great place to begin uh, with Mary Oliver. So it's sort of like a Mary Oliver 101. Um, Upstream is just a, a book of little brief essays on a wide variety of subjects. If you're looking to just read one as an excerpt, I would recommend the essay called Bird. And that is this one here. It's just a couple pages long and it begins 
On a December morning many years ago, I brought a young, injured, black back gull home from the beach. It was, in fact, Christmas morning as well as bitter cold, which may account for my act. Injured gulls are common. Nature's maw receives them again implacably, almost never is a rescue justified by a return to health and freedom, and this gull was close to that deep maw. It made no protest when I picked it up, the eyes were half shut, the body so starved it seemed to hold nothing but air. Mary Oliver is an incredible writer. She's known for her poetry as much as her prose, if not more so. Uh, but if you're looking for a delightful nature read, uh, even when addressing difficult subjects, she does it in a very accessible, warm and friendly way, which sort of embraces you and hugs you uh, rather than alienates you because you don't know enough to read the book. Um, you know, and you, it, lots of nonfiction books have this sort of uh, in medias res attitude where you have to already know so much about a subject. Mary Oliver's essays and poems just sort of embrace you and take you in and speak to something primal and archetypal in each one of us where we already know. And um, it's just a really good place to be. So I would recommend Upstream by Mary Oliver. And then, although lots of people say they don't understand modern poetry, they don't know how to read it, um, they're not used to poetry that doesn't rhyme in an old fashioned way, and they're not quite sure what to make of new poetry, I would strongly suggest starting with one of two of Mary Oliver's collections. I would either start with a book called Why I Wake Early. That was actually my introduction to Mary Oliver. It's just full of absolutely lovely, accessible poems which really hone in on joy, loss as well, but again, in a very accessible way that you'll be able to appreciate and take to heart. And they're kind of like little meditations and it's kind of fun to read like one a day. Um, and the other book that I would recommend, which was actually the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, is American Primitive. This is one of my favorite books of poetry of all time. And um, it just includes such wonderful poems. First Snow, Tasting the Wild Grapes, Egrets, Fall Song, The Lost Children, In the Pine Woods, Crow and Owl, and many others. Um, it's rough hewn. You can smell the tar and the pine sap when you read these poems and you can see the cold starlight overhead on a November evening. So um, this is a wonderful, wonderful book either to gift someone or to gift yourself. Um, it's very slim. It just goes to show you that uh, something doesn't need to be a mammoth uh, 800 pages long to be good. Um, so I strongly recommend American Primitive by Mary Oliver. Now the remainder of the books that I have to share with you are not necessarily on a nature theme. They're on a wide variety of themes, but they are all nonfiction. They're all books that I have read in the past and they've absolutely blown me away and I do recommend them highly. The first of these is a book called The N-Word, Who Can Say It, Who Shouldn't, and Why by Jabari Asim. Very heated subject. The debate over the N-word touches almost every aspect of American popular culture. Does it ever have an appropriate place in the media? Are rappers justified in using it? Should Huckleberry Finn, which repeats it 215 times, be taught in high school? As the cultural critic Jabari Asim explains, none of these questions can be addressed effectively without a clear knowledge of the word's bitter legacy. He draws on a wide range of examples from science, politics, the arts, and more uh, to show the prevalence and scourge of bigotry in America over the past 400 years. Um, now, I 
was so impressed by this book that when I was working at the public library, I organized and moderated a reading discussion group on this subject. And um, I was part of a, a, a group uh, called Wayne Action for Racial Equality. And um, so it was focusing on racial equality and how to be an anti-racist um, ally in a semi-rural to rural farm area. So um, yeah, this book blew my mind. Um, I did write a um, outline for the discussion that I led. Um, I'll just give you some of the examples. Um, that Jabari Asim uh, draws his argument from. Um, in 1619, John Rolfe's diary refers to 20 African captives arriving in North America. Um, so it's excerpts from John Rolfe's diary. He talks about um, the Boston Massacre and Crispus Attucks. He talks about in 1776, Thomas Jefferson um, crossed out a paragraph in an early draft of the Declaration of Independence, which would have condemned slavery. Um, and one part which was very memorable to me dealt with in 1785 Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia and you can look this up on Gutenberg um, which categorizes and taxidermizes flora fauna vegetables landforms rodents and black humans um, and it's all sort of an argument by Jefferson as to why uh, black people require less sleep, have animal urges, um, don't feel pain as much as white people so you can work them harder, et cetera, et cetera. Another part which really um, made a huge impression on me was talking about uh, traveling minstrel shows and also state fairs and sideshows which persisted uh, in our area because I looked up local newspaper clippings online when I was researching this as a librarian um, and so it talks about minstrel, minstrel shows um, so there's a clipping from a local paper um, and what would happen at these minstrel shows and also um, at state fairs uh, they used to have a game where you would go up and instead of, you know, trying to hit the duck with the baseball, um, there would actually be a young black person there and you could hit the black person, uh, which was appalling to me. And so, in any event, um, without digressing, I think this is a very important read and I wanted to make sure that I included it in this video. Um, it's not as genteel a subject as a gentle nature read, but it's super, super important. And if you are interested in race relations and American history, I strongly recommend it. Another book which tells an extremely important story about American and Canadian and worldwide history is Polio, An American Story, The Crusade That Mobilized the Nation Against the 20th Century's Most Feared Disease. This is by David M. Oshinsky, and this was a winner of the 2006 Pulitzer Prize in History. This book, also blew my mind. Um, this talks about uh, poliomyelitis, um, its beginnings, how people were getting it. Um, it talks about Franklin Delano Roosevelt contracting polio. It talks about um, children in institutions and the ableism of uh, that existed where orphanages and asylums housing children with special needs um, that they were sort of experimented on with trial vaccines without anybody's consent except for the people running the homes. Um, it talks about a worldwide search for a cure. The race was on between Dr. Salk, <coughs> Jonas Salk, 
and Albert Sabin. It talks about the Canadian effort and what was done there to look for a cure. It talks about Jonas Salk's assistants who, um, some of them were women, who spent, were relentless and spent countless hours in the lab, <clears throat> excuse me, and some of them actually uh, came up with very critical information which provided Salk the ability to finally come up with a successful vaccine um, who were not given credit for their discoveries or for their work. Um, there's only one man of the year on the cover of Time and it was uh, Salk. Um, but incredible discovery and uh, vaccine finding nonetheless. And it's just a gripping suspense story. Uh, it's, it's like a slice of America. Um, it's incredible. It's just a, a wonderful social history. David Oshinsky, I think, is a brilliant, brilliant writer and absolutely deserves the Pulitzer Prize for his writing in this book, Polio, An American Story. Another book which I strongly recommend for nonfiction November, if you've never read it, is Seabiscuit, an American Legend by the author Lauren Hillenbrand. Uh, this book is a very special one to me because um, my father and I used to walk along the canal together and we would have book talks. We would talk about the books we had read lately. Uh, this was prior to his dementia. Um, so I would buy him books and he would read them and then we would discuss them when we took our walks along the canal. And Seabiscuit was one that he absolutely loved and I loved as well. It's a fascinating story. Um, uh, it's um, about a horse. Um, that um, was a champion um, and they all came over terrible handicaps to become legends of the racetrack. Now um, you can say a lot about horse racing and how horses are treated in horse racing and um, I am sympathetic to all of that so please understand that but uh, regardless of that this is a story worth telling it's a story worth hearing and um, the three principal characters that it deals with are charles howard red pollard and tom smith um, and red pollard was the jockey who rode sea biscuit um, and it just talks about their hard scrabble luck and all of the obstacles they all went through um, before winning. Tom Smith and Seabiscuit, here's a picture here. So if you're looking for a, not a rags to riches, but a, a hardship to the wind sort of a story, I strongly recommend Seabiscuit. Another book by an author I, I really admire greatly is Isaac Storm, a gripping account fascinating to its core, a man, a time, and the deadliest hurricane in history. This is a book by Eric Larson. Now, um, I have a little bit of a backstory about Eric Larson. Um, Eric Larson, uh, I was in, a book club where Eric Larson made an appearance um, and uh, I had asked him if he would pop onto my book club's Facebook page because we were reading his book Dead Wake and so I was sort of pleading with him in an email would you please just make an appearance it would mean everything to our members if you would just sort of hop on and say hi when we're having our discussion and um, he was a really good egg he he did hop on and he made some comments and um, uh, joined in the discussion a little bit and joked around a bit so he was a really good sport so Eric Larson we super super appreciated you and we still all remember that to this day um, and so this book Isaac Storm is actually one of his earlier books and it is gripping um, it 
Doesn't seem like it would be a gripping subject, but the way Larson writes, history is like an exciting page turner of a novel. Um, so September 8th, 1900 began innocently in the seaside town of Galveston, Texas. Even Isaac Klein, resident meteorologist for the U.S. Weather Bureau, failed to grasp the true meaning of the strange deep sea swells and peculiar winds that greeted the city that morning. Mere hours later, Galveston found itself submerged by a monster hurricane that completely destroyed the town and killed over 6,000 people in what remains the greatest natural disaster in American history. And Isaac Klein found himself the victim of a devastatingly personal tragedy. Using Klein's own telegrams, letters, and reports, the testimony of scores of survivors, and our latest understanding of the science of hurricanes, Eric Larson builds a chronicle of one man's heroic struggle and fatal miscalculation in the face of a storm of unimaginable magnitude. What I find fascinating about this story is that this is a hurricane that occurred um, at the turn of the century in September 1900. Now, the beginning of the 20th century is a favorite historical time period of mine, the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the Edwardian era, as we say, even though those are British terms. Um, <clears throat> we often use them in America as well. Um, but I just love uh, any lore or history, social history from the turn of the century, 1900, 1910, all that period leading up to World War I. And so to imagine a devastating, huge hurricane at that time is very evocative um, and tragic, but also very interesting to learn how he tried to correct his errors and how he tried to warn everybody. It's kind of like Chicken Little, with the sky is falling down and people not listening to your warnings. So um, a great piece of storytelling, Isaac Storm by Eric Larson. And then just a few more here. I actually have two by the same author, and that is uh, Deva Sobel. And um, I think she is just an incredible writer. She's a science writer. She's written for many major publications. I really do admire her. And the first of these books is Longitude, the true story of a lone genius who solved the world's uh, greatest scientific problem of his time. Um, and this is, of course, about uh, John Harrison, and um, he was a clockmaker, a uh, watchmaker, and so it's his 40-year obsession with building his perfect timekeeper, known today as the chronometer. Full of heroism and chicanery, brilliance and the absurd, it's a fascinating brief history of astronomy, navigation, and clockmaking. So, um, yes, this took place in 1714. And up to that time, the, uh, you could figure out um, latitude fairly easily, but once you were at sea and lost sight of land, you could not calculate longitude. And because of this, uh, there were many shipwrecks and other disasters which could have been preventable. Um, and um, so Harrison, uh, was a man who was on a mission to resolve this, to solve the problem, and um, he did. And Davis Sobel, in an interview, was saying how she originally, uh, this was a, a magazine article, and it took her a year even to sell just a magazine article on this topic because everyone was rejecting it. All the editors were rejecting it, saying, who's really going to be interested in a story like that? Um, and well, time has proven that a lot of people are interested in this story. Uh, this has been reprinted many times. There's many editions of Longitude out there now. And um, I was fortunate enough to go into my little corner used bookstore and look what I found. When I picked this up and opened it, it is signed by Davis Sobel and it is a first edition. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah.
really good book and so if you're looking for a little piece of interesting history if you're interested in navigation the sea mariners um, the navy and all of that um, you might want to pick up a copy of longitude it's not a very long book it's very doable for nonfiction november and then the other book that i have by davis sobel is another favorite of mine and another one that i discussed with my dad on our little canal walks and that is Galileo's Daughter a historical memoir of science faith and love this is in a library wrapper so um, it's probably shining in the ring light here but this is just so fascinating oh my goodness um, and this is about Galileo Galilei uh, who lived 1564 to 1642 and it is the correspondence between Galileo and Galileo's daughter who was a cloistered nun and um, her name was Soir Mary Celesta so I'm feeling a little connection there because of the name Celeste um, and it's fascinating because his daughter uh, reveals what life was like um, living in her sequestered world uh, and she Dava Sobel also talks about um, Florence of the Medicis and the papal court in Rome um, it's just fascinating the way personal letters would be she describes things like what she had for dinner and when she went to pray and what her clothing was like and could he send her a little bit of money so that she could afford something um, it's really fascinating it is a bit of a chunky monkey but um, I think it's a great addition to anybody's nonfiction library Galileo's daughter Okay, and then just one more to go here. Um, this is Damnation Island, Poor, Sick, Mad, and Criminal in 19th Century New York by Stacy Horn. If you have an interest in the, um, uh, the 1800s, the early 1900s, if you are interested in the history of women and women's rights and suffragism and the way women have been depicted in society and the whole thing about hysteria and hysteria cures and uh, people being uh, committed to asylums for madness and sanity etc because they had special needs or because they were poor or because it was a woman who got pregnant um, this is the book for you if you're interested in disability rights um, mm, any of that uh, this is a gripping read it's fascinating it's full of a lot of sad stories that's the only thing so it's not the most uplifting of books but this talks about New York's Blackwell's Island site of a lunatic asylum two prisons an almshouse and a number of hospitals and it quickly became in the words of a visiting Charles Dickens a lounging listless madhouse digging through city records newspaper articles and archival reports Stacy Horn tells a gripping narrative through the voices of the island's inhabitants and you can see I've got um, quite a few notes in here um, it is absolutely simultaneously horrifying electrifying um, it will open your eyes to another part of our history and um, I think it's a, a very important addition to anyone's nonfiction library as well damnation island so that's quite a few titles thank you for sticking with me to the end of this video um, I really love reading nonfiction I know that on my channel I do have a tendency to share 
more cozy mysteries, light verse and poetry, seasonal collections of, you know, recipes and crafts and vintage children's books and things like that. But make no mistake, I read a lot of nonfiction as well and um, have always loved nonfiction. I'm looking forward to sharing even more nonfiction November titles with you in weeks to come. And um, so I will be back next week with another video. I hope you're reading. I hope you're being cozy, staying warm, and we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.